everyone, good morning. You're all very welcome to the Think Global Forum Summit Week. This is indeed a very special occasion as it is our first ever week-long event for TGF. And we're very excited about the week's lineup. It's great to have so many of our longtime community members and equally welcome some new faces. This is our actually our 28th TGF Think Global Forum event since it was founded in 2016. Um, and it has all been made possible. This milestone event has been made possible by Vistatech. Um, we have hosted sessions across Europe and the US, and more recently, for obvious reasons, uh, for the past 12 months or so online. And in a strange kind of way, the pandemic has been a catalyst for bringing everyone together under a single event. This was something that we had recognized over the, the years and throughout the numerous events we had hosted, that regardless of the industry that our community and our participants and forum executives uh, belong to, some of the challenges and the conversations were common. As I mentioned, Think Global Forum is a Vistatech backed initiative. And although it has evolved quite a bit over time, we're constantly welcoming new members to the community, new contributors. Our mission has stayed the same. And that mission is to bring together like minded thought leaders in the business of going global to share experiences, discuss, brainstorm, leverage the collective intelligence, generate new creative, insightful and, and strategic kind of inspiring thinking in a relaxed and open setting. I'm equally delighted to be celebrating with you all International Women's Day, a day when we all choose to challenge. And what better way to do it to honor the day then with an outstanding female keynote speaker that we will be um, hearing from later on. You can look out for all the photos, videos, testimonies that the Think Global Forum and the Vistatech teams have been putting together to celebrate today and to um, demonstrate how we choose to challenge gender bias and gender inequality today. You can equally listen to some really interesting interviews on our Vista Talks podcast that celebrates great women. Speaking of great women, I would like to introduce you to my co-hosts, uh, my partners in crime for the week, Teresa Loles and Eva Murphy. Hey, hello. And I'm really happy that all of you can join us for what's going to be a really action-packed five days. I'm going to hand you over to Teresa, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what we have lined up for the week. So over to you, Teresa. Hello, everybody, and um, happy International Women's Day to everybody as well. It's lovely to see some of the messages coming through from all around the world. Um, so um, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll let you know what's happening for the rest of the week. So Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we are hosting roundtable style discussions, a little like the boardroom sessions that we hosted before at some of our live events. Uh, so you may um, have experienced those roundtable or boardroom discussions. Um, we have a little twist with those. The audience will be wider and the session will be facilitated by a panel of experts from the community. So it should be really engaging and also a lot of uh, good fun. So on Tuesday, we have Global Content Operations, which is hosted by IFA, and we have panelists from Adidas, Indeed, and from Salesforce. And that should be really fantastic looking at content strategy and content operations. On Wednesday, we revisit World UX, which is a follow up from a really fantastic webinar that Maria hosted last November. Um, and she is joined on Wednesday by panelists from Verizon Connect, URA, uh, Line Plus Corporation and Dr. Olia. And then on Thursday, I am hugely excited to host a panel discussion on global technical communications. We will be looking at machine translation, both the business case and future insights. And I'm delighted to have panelists from Enercon, Daimler, Biosense Webster, uh, Johnson Controls and GE Healthcare. 
Um, and then finally, on Friday, as a thank you to all of our attendees and all of our participants, we are running a Thought Leadership Masterclass. Uh, this is turning challenges into opportunities, the resilient mindset with Mark Pollock. Uh, Mark is an international speaker, he's an explorer, and he's an author, and uh, he became the first blind man to race to the South Pole. Um, everything he does is about helping people build resilience and collaborating. So I think that's going to be a fantastic way to top off our week. Um, and finally, just to note that uh, the sessions Tuesday to Friday are not recorded. Um, so similar to how our boardroom sessions are run at live events, by not recording, we're really facilitating open communication and discussion. And that's at the very heart of what uh, our Think Global Forum community is. So hopefully you'll enjoy these sessions with us and we look forward to you all participating. Thank you, back to you, Maria. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks a million. And a little bit of housekeeping, you know, uh, sort of kicking off uh, an event would be uh, would be really happening without some housekeeping. You should have all received the Zoom link for the sessions you have selected and signed up for um, for this week. Let us know if you haven't received it. You should have also received an event pack with the Zoom background that you are welcome and free to use. We would encourage you to use just to kind of make us all feel part of the community. And we're going to be reminding everybody of kind of our Zoom etiquette throughout the sessions during the week. But we would sort of kindly ask everybody to ensure you're muted unless you're speaking. We encourage you to have the video turned on, but we appreciate that it's not always going to be possible. Raise your hand if you want to um, participate and we will give you the floor. Um, we are going to use the chat to kind of say hello, if you need tech help or whatever, and we're going to focus on the Q&A function in Zoom for all of the questions. And um, also some of the interactive Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday sessions are going to make use of Slido and truly, especially for Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, your participation is, is key to the success this week. It's about sharing, it's about learning from each other. And, and we really hope um, that, that, that it will be that the three, uh, particularly the three mid midweek sessions will do exactly that. That you'll feel that you have learned and equally you have um, shared with your, with your peers. We're also gonna have um, an illustrator during the sessions. And as um, Teresa mentioned, the sessions are not recorded, um, but we do have Hank um, who will, at the end of each of the days, um, he's gonna show us his sketch um, of uh, an illustration capturing kind of uh, the, the key messages and, and kind of the key concepts um, for each of the days. And just a little reminder, today's running order is first and foremost, the opening address by Visitex CEO, Tom Murray, followed by a keynote by Mel McVeigh, and then some Q&A. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Visitex CEO, Tom Murray, and thank him very, very much for being such an incredible support to the Think Global Forum mission for the past five years. Tom, the floor is yours. Okay, firstly, I'd like to welcome everybody to this, our first Think Global uh, Forum week. Um, especially, I'd like to say thanks to all of the participants. These events are participative and the success of them is down to all of your contributions over the last number of years, over all the 28 events. Um, they have made them uh, what they are and Vistatech as an organization and myself are very proud to be associated with the forum and very proud of the outcomes that we've seen from them. Um, over the course of the week, we've got some great speakers and a packed agenda of interesting topics. So I'm sure we will find, um, we'll all find something interesting and informative um, over the course of the week. Um, it has certainly been a tumultuous year for everyone, um, none less than ourselves at Vistatech. Um, last year on the 12th of March, we shuttered our offices here in Dublin and in the space of a very short few hours, um, a process on a tried and tested way of working that had developed and evolved over 20 years literally went out the window. Um, the, this change that the pandemic has brought about has certainly given us all pause for thought, both at a personal and professional level, and I think equally at an organizational and a societal level. 
there has been a seismic change in the way these various strata of the world interact with each other. And it would seem to me now that um, a significant part of the solution to the pandemic that we now face um, is an acceptance that acting in each other's interest is no longer simply a morally good thing to do. It is now a basic uh, step in how we're going to, uh, to, to beat this, this pandemic. So as I say, it is fair to say that the, the, the last year has, has brought a large number of very big challenges, but challenges generally bring opportunities for improvement. And that's what I think we need to be focusing on. I'm not quite sure who said that a good crisis shouldn't be wasted, but there is certainly a, a grain of truth in that statement. And given the price that this uh, pandemic has taken on all of us, it would probably be morally wrong for us not to try and learn and improve things um, based on what we've seen over the last year. Um, from our own industry's perspective, our standpoint, it's difficult to think of a set of circumstances that are, could have more clearly highlighted uh, the importance or the need for a comprehensive global strategy to growth and um, that does involve as a key part a, a digital dimension. Um, we at Vistatech have been advocating um, this digital strand of a global strategy to all of our customers now for quite some years. Uh, we believe strongly that um, all customers are looking for ways to interact uh, with, with their service providers in a digital way more and more as time passes. Um, I don't believe that conventional mediums um, are no longer important. I think they're a vital part, but certainly um, digital is becoming more important. It's not digital or dead. It's not a binary decision, but certainly the last year and the pandemic has supercharged the shift of um, the digital requirement to the center of most boardroom discussions around globalization strategies in the last year or so. Um, now, before we all lose the run of ourselves in terms of the, the rush to digital, um, I think we need to pause for a moment and we need to think about what it is that we're trying to achieve and very importantly, the environments in which we all live and work and to acknowledge the human aspect of that environment. For any strategy, um, digital or otherwise, to be successful, it must take account of the environment that it is to be implemented in. Uh, the chain that links um, any business to its end users, to its customers, is influenced by a wide variety of very complex factors. And in crafting a div digital strategy, excuse me, um, this complexity is largely driven by the human element. This is a fact that is crucially important to acknowledge in trying to create a sustainable digital strategy, both in terms of your target market and your global content strategies, but also in terms of your own organizations. For example, you know, within our own organization, we've had to pivot our HR and management practices to address the loss of social and cultural cohesion that an office setting can create. And that has certainly been a challenge from an organization's uh, perspective on your digital trail. And um, it's important to acknowledge that, that it, is a, it is a living and a, a, if you like an ecosystem approach to, to, to the digital strategy. It is not build it and they will come. Um, I kind of view you know, digital as just one strand perhaps of a communication ecosystem where there are many strands where organizations communicate with their, with their customers and try to influence uh, behaviors. So you must first engage, but then you must retain and you retain through the provision of ongoing meaningful content that impacts the behavior of your consumers or your customers at the end of the chain. So you know, you must view it as a, as, a, as a living organism almost. From a macro and societal point of view, I think we can all see that the, the most successful organizations are those who aligned their values and their core principles um, as closely with all of their stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, I mean staff, I mean shareholders, I mean customers. Now, the interesting thing that the, the digital, if you like, revolution or the rush to digital um, has impacted in this area is around transparency. Um, and has brought the transparency of those values and the importance of them to a whole new level. Um, customers and all stakeholders, they want to know what type of organization they are dealing with, what their core principles are, what they will stand for, and perhaps what they won't stand for. Because these particular, these answers to those questions, they will influence um, buying decisions. And certainly, you know, the, the visibility of those um, values and principles of organizations are um, much more accessible in the digital world. 
So I suppose the point that I'm making is that digital can affect everything in all aspects of our lives. And what we want to do here is we want to make sure that those impacts and those effects are positive and to try and harness them and help us and our customers to achieve their goals. So stepping back a little bit, I think in summary, we at Vistatech we're not saying anything massively different in terms of our philosophy on global content and its power. We still believe that all content has power and content properly deployed um, can actually, metaphorically speaking, move mountains. But what has actually happened in the last while is that the digital strand of that content strategy or that globalization strategy has really come into sharp relief. And the imperative for having one has never been clearer, certainly. And we can see that over the last year. Um, and certainly it has been very sharply felt by those that haven't um, been prepared. Um, Thinking globally and having a business strategy that reflects that um, is now really the cornerstone of all um, robust and agile organizations. Um, those that take a multifaceted view of their content strategy are those that will survive and thrive regardless of the trials that are thrown at them. Um, now, before I hand back to Aoife, I would like to acknowledge that today is um, International Women's Day. Um, and I know that over the course of the week, certainly the pandemic um, will probably feature in the vast majority of conversations that, that, that will be had. And I would like to point out that uh, the country that perhaps dealt with the pandemic in the most efficient um, and effective manner um, was New Zealand, a country interestingly led by a woman. Um, Jacinda Arden. Um, one of the points that was mentioned in the intro um, around International Women's Day was this point of challenging gender biases. And I think that's that's a really interesting um, uh, point to make. And I would strongly urge anyone, if they want to understand how to uh, challenge uh, gender biases, they should um, look at a speech given by the former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, on misogyny in Australian politics. It's an eye opener and it's definitely how uh, gender biases should be challenged. Um, personally speaking, um, Vistatech has uh, quite a, 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 an unusual, perhaps, uh, gender balance in the organization where the uh, female to male ratio is actually six to four. And I think that mix and that uh, variety of perspectives and balance has, has been intrinsic to the successes that the organization was, has, has had. And I would pay tribute to all those involved in that. Um, in closing, I would like to wish you all a very enjoyable and more importantly, I hope, informative summit week. Um, hopefully you will leave um, with a little bit more insight and perhaps some interesting and thought-provoking uh, uh, commentary. Thank you very much all for your participation and I look forward to hearing and seeing from you over the next while. Back to you, Eva. Thank you very much, Tom. That was a, a great welcome note. Um, so true what you say about the ecosystem of communication and how, although we're all undergoing this digital transformation in industry, that really what it's all about is a communications and a content strategy with a digital strand. Um, I'm going to welcome Mel um, McVeigh, our keynote speaker, and we should be able to see Mel and her screen shortly. Great, great. So Mel has a fantastic um, keynote and thought provoking keynote um, for us this, uh, this afternoon. And Mel, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, yes, we look forward, very much look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for inviting me today. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to sharing some thoughts about how we work at Condé Nast and some of the challenges we face as a global, global company. Um, and I want to thank the team for actually organising and inviting me today. So it's a privilege to talk to you. And I noticed um, many people from around the world, which is truly exciting. I'm Australian, so I also love the reference to Julia Gillard. That is an incredible talk about her role as Prime Minister in Australia and the misogyny that she um, had to deal with. And I'm currently based in Spain, so it's unfortunately raining outside in Madrid, but um, truly global conversation. So um, I'm going to kick off. So if I share my screen and then tell me if you can see my presentation. We can, Mel. Thank you. Good, perfect. Okay, fantastic. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is strategy in the context of making um, and how we tend to think about it at Condé Nast, but also throughout my experience um, working in digital strategy and, and technology and implementation of products and services globally, how um, I think I've reflected on, on the role and how we can produce and launch things at scale quickly. And we're going to do that in the context of puzzles explored as mysteries. So a little bit about me, um, my role, um, I am the VP of product at Condé Nast. Um, you may have heard of us before, but we um, are a global company um, based out of, well, based out of, I think, 12 owned and operated countries and of which we have 26 licensee markets. Um, my role is the VP of product across consumer brands and commerce. What that means is, is that I handle um, the integration and the globalization of our digital properties across Vogue, GQ, Condé Nast Traveller, Architectural Digest, Allure and Glamour. We also have in the portfolio brands like The New Yorker, Wired and Vanity Fair. And so it's a really diverse organization. We cover anything from, you know, hardcore long form journalism through subscription products like The New Yorker and Wired. Vogue needs no introduction and operates in 26 markets globally and some brands that are specifically in the US but you know offer incredibly good service um, is a brand like Allure um, in two markets but actually is one of the leading kind of beauty brands um, editorial globally. The other part of my job is is to look at our baby of the monetization strategies that we have in the organization. We're still primarily an ads led business we have a very strong and viable subscriptions and membership portfolio, but commerce is growing really fast. And that can be anything from affiliate, dropship or other monetization models. So that's my day job. It's what I spend a lot of my time um, chained to the computer and looking at how we globalize, um, particularly as we bring the organization together. Um, up until two years ago, it was, well, in fact, three years ago, it was 12 separate companies. About two years ago, it became two. Um, so an international business and the US business, and now it is truly integrating as a global company. The other part that is interesting, but is relevant to this conversation today is that I'm actually a trained artist and photographer. Um, it's, it, it did not used to be relevant to my career and I kept them quite separate. But as I go through the learnings about what it is to be an artist, um, I apply a lot of those frameworks and technologies and, and processes to how we do strategy. And then the final part is I'm a nomad. Um, what that means is I think I was a digital nomad before it became a term, um, but have traveled and lived around the world. Um, what that has taught me, um, having worked a lot around Europe, is the importance of diversity and culture. And that, you know, more Anglo-American ways of working don't necessarily apply as you apply that out in a global context. And it's something that if you've never worked truly globally, is a kind of learning that most organizations or individuals go through. Um, and one of my first experiences that was working for TUI and having to work um, in and out of Stockholm for about six months and the, the rapid fire education of working in a Nordic um, environment. So what am I gonna talk about today? Um, it's broken down into a story um, in four chapters. Um, I'm hoping to weave a variety of threads. Um, they're not necessarily designed to be linear. It's a few, a few kind of things to drop ideas into your frame of reference and then questions at the end. So it's around strategy, people, outcomes, and actually curiosity. So here we go. So the first thing um, is that strategy is nourished by patience. Um, if there, there is a book, and I reference the reference materials at the end, called The Messy Middle. Scott Belsky, um, uh, created Behance, if anyone uses it, which was bought by Adobe, but was a creative um, community for artists and designers and illustrators to share their work. And the really key thing about strategy, and I am guilty of forgetting this too, is that it takes time. It takes time to take that really small seed of an idea and grow it into a tree, grow it into something that you didn't imagine it before. But even if you know that you are growing something, and I'll use the metaphor of a tree, how it evolves, how it grows its branches is not as you would imagine. And so the final sort of output and its ongoing growth, even though it is still structurally a tree, will be something that you never imagined. And it goes back to, in terms of when you're looking um, at strategy, that it takes a long time of iteration 
and a real commitment to getting there. And that's what he called the messy middle, right? It's something that actually artists and creatives are often very comfortable sitting in that space between the unknown and the known. But for certain sort of parts of industry, um, certain disciplines, it's a very uncomfortable space to be when you want structure, when you want outcomes and when you want next steps. But the patience is to stick it out. If you know that you're heading in the right direction and you can take your organization on that path, you will truly implement the thing that you imagined in the first place. And so I start with this context, which is lovely in the context of International Women's Day. So three years ago, I was in New York. I had just started at Condé Nast. Um, I had had a very frustrating day at work. Um, I was actually having a glass of wine with a colleague kind of wondering how I was, why I was being so challenged in terms of trying to you know, implement new things. It was primarily to do with the fact that it was the first time I was working in an American and primarily New York culture. As we were walking through the Oculus Center, which is underneath the World Trade Center, we saw this um, mobile sculpture and hanging. And at this perspective, we were both like, what is this? This makes no sense. It's, it's, it, it's like ugly. It's, it's kind of interfering with this beautiful sculptural um, building. And as we walked through it, we turned around and this is what it actually said. And what it was, was actually a campaign for International Women's Day um, or Women's Month around equal pay. So what it actually is, is currencies from around the world with actually the faces of women from those cultures. But the key point about this piece of art is about perspective. And it goes back to the detail of being inside of your strategy and having that long range altitude of understanding your North Star. That unless you have the perspective to stand back, you can often get lost in the weeds. You can't really see what you're doing and why. This is often the, the, criti the, um, so the criticism that often people on the ground will give leadership when they're asking why are they doing something? Because they can't see the altitude that you're operating in. And it is our responsibility as leaders to basically show the path of where they're to go, to give them that altitude and that perspective. To change requires doing things differently. It also requires to stand back and allowing people to absorb all the different messages into one. Um, and I love this as a reminder because I had to step back and remind myself that I had jumped to conclusions. I had made a judgment. This is going to work. Why is this ugly? And as I walked away, I was reminded that, you know, change actually takes time and it takes perspective. So where does change come into your strategy? It is the space between what is old and what is new. You need a compass and you need a map. And that path is never clear with both mysteries and puzzles to solve. So while you will have a roadmap and everyone will ask you for dates and everyone will ask you for the final destination, like any traveler, there will be pivots. There'll be things that you have to navigate that you did not foresee when you started on this adventure. It also involves doing things differently and leaving the old behind and doing the opposite of what you have imagined. And that is one of the challenges with strategy and convincing and getting people to on board to something that they are not familiar with. So the best thing, or not the best thing, one of the most interesting things about the pandemic was the speed of change. It was no longer a white paper. It was no longer a conversation with a small group of people about digital nomadism. It became a core reality for the majority of the population that can work remotely. Now that could have taken years or decades, but it had been an idea that was seeding in certain industries, particularly tech. But it does involve, and so we were given an external event, effectively a black swan, to basically change our thinking. As a leader, your job and our, jo our role as part of delivering a strategy is navigating and creating serendipity in the workplace to allow ch change to seed. And it's something that can be really hard and challenging when you're dealing with different you know, people and personalities and ways of working. So it starts with a vision and some, starting with something new means you have to imagine something that never existed before. Think about it when you're buying a house or when you're trying to renovate, planning a wedding, buying a car, going on a holiday. It starts with a seed of an idea. I wanna go and change my whole life and go live in another country. You have to imagine the end game. You don't know how it fully will be, but you have to actually then backtrack all the steps that you need to take. But if you don't have that vision or you don't have that idea in your head, you can't change what you can't see. This is where creativity does actually come into play. A spreadsheet will only tell you 
one thing. How are you going to make money? How are you going to make profit? That is the rational alignment. I need to hit a certain amount of revenue, a certain amount of conversion to basically make a company profitable. But vision comes from emotions. It comes from the passion and belief that what we are doing is the right path to follow. If you need an organization of 7,000 or even 20 people to follow and believe and, and work and stretch and grow themselves, they have to believe that it's worth it because ultimately we're human, right? And if we don't believe, then we will put up roadblocks as individuals and as teams and as organizations. If you are fundamentally, like we are at the moment, trying to reimagine Condé, we have to tell the story and it is a narrative about where we're trying to go. And it isn't just about spreadsheets. So there are two types of things that we're trying to solve. One is a puzzle and one is a mystery. So the easiest things to do in a strategy is to understand a puzzle and note that not all strategy at a business level, we may have a strategy on a technology level to just migrate a variety of websites. We may have an operational strategy to optimize costs. The interesting and the simple thing about puzzles is they can be solved, right? It's a formula, it's a framework, it's a series of building blocks, it's tactics. They always have an answer. So when we're looking at things from a program perspective or even an implementation, you are solving a puzzle, right? But the challenge is you cannot solve a mystery through a puzzle, right? If you apply the techniques of getting all the pieces and putting them all in place, you're, you're missing the beauty of the mystery. And the thing about mysteries is that the answer is not known. It is the combination of factors between known and unknown, and they can only be framed. Right, So they're framed in the context of a question and they can be interacted based on past knowledge, future knowledge and where we need to go. So the interesting thing is when we start is asking the question, first one, are we solving a puzzle or are we solving a mystery? And this is where it comes to the joy of being a traveller, right? The serendipity of not knowing where you're going to go. If you may know your final destination and you know that you have to drive from point A to point B, you're not really clear what might happen in that journey. So we search not for better answers, but actually and fundamentally, and the more and more I, I think about it, and I've actually given this talk three times, twice internally to Con Condé, and I see it even more now on the day-to-day. -day. If you ask the wrong question, you will always, you will always get the wrong answer. And so the inputs, the framing, and how we investigate this path and this puzzle and mystery we're trying to solve is as crucial as the outcomes we are trying to drive. So let's think about the question. It is the single most important part of our strategy and our brief because it really determines and frames the intended result. So if we can we pose the question in a different way and can we reframe so are we solving for problems versus opportunities? Semantics really matter. And it matters even more so when you're thinking about foreign, you know, language um, or teams where English is not the first language or whereby in a context where the usage of those words means different things. One of my favorite, I have two sort of joys in, in language. One is the nuances between say Australian and British and South African and American, so the English language. And being in Spain where I don't speak fluently, but I'm always understanding and having people translate the nuance of language and how colorful a language um, it is and how it is used to define certain things. Um, English language is not so much the same. And so this reframing is really important, right? We could get a brief from our management or from our team. How do we create a 50 million pound business over five years? That is a very rational question. It often requires you to solve a puzzle, you backtrack, you look at audience, you look at conversion, you look at all the um, building blocks that would make, um, give you the answer to that question. But what if we refract, and this was a brief I was given when I built Continent, um, Telegraph Travel um, in the UK and took it from a 20 million to a 50 million business actually in two years. It was not our intention, the plan was five, but we did it in two. Um, we reframed that question into how do we get more customers traveling and how do we make it easy and inspirational? And then how do we monetize it? In the context of say Condé Nast is that how do I pivot my brand from a reader led to a consumer led proposition before I get to the 50 million? Or how do I really meet the needs of our consumers right now in the context of, their, of the behavior that they're looking at? So travel is a really interesting sector at the moment 
Most people would say that people are not traveling. That is actually not true. Um, our brown Condonas traveler is having the highest traffic it's ever had. Um, the questions have changed though. What they're looking for has changed and their needs have changed. The desire to travel has never actually changed. So I'm gonna frame it in an example. Um, and this is a Zaha Hadid build, building in Macau. It is the Morpheus Hotel. And to, and to look at the, the framing of the question, I don't actually know what the brief was that was given for this hotel, but it would have been to create a building with four walls in the style, you know, with some sort of flavor and of the local culture. And this is the result. So um, while it is structurally a building with four walls and it has an interior and it has rooms and it has restaurants and it has elevators and all the functional and structural things that you would require in a, in a hotel, um, it has inspiration that is completely disconnected from architecture. So the first one is, is that it uses the figure eight in the center, which is a measure of good luck in Chinese. This is also a casino. So it's referencing, you know, the, the idea of luck comes from numerology and all the other aspects of Chinese astrology. The second part is, is that the um, design and the aesthetic of the building is referencing how jade is made in a natural context. And the beauty of that is, is, is that it, it comes through in terms of this building. So as an architect, where you have to follow very structural foundations and it is a puzzle to un, un, unlock how you build it, and it would have started with a sketch and a blueprint and a set of foundations, it was envisaged and dreamed of as an artist, right? It is something that you could have not possibly imagined through your own eyes, but obviously Zaha Hadid is one of the most incredible architects of the last hundred years because she pushes the boundaries of what a building could, should do and what it says about a place that it inhabits. And so it curves and it feels more like a form that's evolved out of the ground rather than actually a building. So part one, strategy, the difference between mysteries and puzzles, right? Is actually really understanding the rules of the things you need to solve for and then breaking them like an artist. So part two, moving into people. So in the digital world, we are now completely and utterly driven by algorithm. Algorithms tend to choose what we read. It influences politics and debate. Um, and it is the cornerstone of almost all technology builds at the moment. But what is really interesting, and particularly when you work again in a content space where a lot of what we do is based on intuition, is that those that can get back to and outside of an algorithmic decision will actually win in the future. What do I mean by that? I don't want the same recommendations on Netflix over and over again. Just because I watch one documentary on a certain topic doesn't mean I want 50 others. Where is the serendipitous moment that gives me a piece of content or something I had never expected that may change my belief in something, may change my learning or even introduce me to something I've never heard of before? I do that at my goal and one of my little personal challenges is often to try and break the algorithm. And I do that with social conversations with my friends. My favorite part of the week um, is Monday morning when Spotify gives me my playlist for the week. When it starts to get really familiar and really generic, as in I'm getting the same type of music over and over again, to break my own habits and that of um, the music that I am being given, I ask other people with very disconnected music tastes to share me their playlists, to basically feed the algorithm to break um, the kind of trends that it's giving. Because what an algorithm will do will only give me past behavior. It will not give me future. And I think is an interesting conversation as we go into technology about understanding and predicting future needs of a consumer rather than past. So this comes from knowing your people. Semantics drive the opportunity space. Like I said before with the question, the question that you ask fundamentally determines the research that you look for. So if I'm in a publishing organization and I'm looking at reader behavior or I'm looking at audience behavior or viewer behavior, so video consumption and articles, then I'm only gonna look for passive opportunities. When you move into commerce, you do get the word consumer, not a great word in terms of consumption or a user, you know, not necessarily also a positive word, but it does change the space of the information that you will look for. Inputs matter just as much as outputs. 
And so one of the things I ask the teams at the moment at Condé is to reframe who the audience is. Who are they? Where are they? What are their attitudes? And most importantly, what and how do they make decisions? In publishing, it's not a common question because it's considered a very passive experience. Watching television used to be a passive experience. Now, while I think research has got very good at understanding those questions, this is not a new, new you know, industry or a practice or a ways of working, but what is often misses, missed is the, it's the intended outcome for the consumer or for your reader. And even if you're reading an article or something on the New York Times or something in the New Yorker, it is about understanding and knowledge, right? So the outcome is, is to be better informed. The outcome is to be, you know, have a knowledge base to talk to your friends around the dinner table or the Zoom, you know, chats. But understanding your audience and what they are doing always has an activity attached to it, which is understanding the why, right? The, not just the outcome they're driving, but why are they seeking that information? Is it to be knowledgeable? Is it to make a decision? Is it to purchase a product? And one of the frameworks, and it is just one of many, um, in a product world, it's called jobs to be done. In a consumer experience, it might be a customer journey map. Um, it can be applied in many ways, but the way that I like to frame it is a job um, is, and jobs also can be quite rational. I like it just to, the tasks to be done, but again, it's semantics. But if you Google it, you can find, you know, a great wealth of information. But the interesting thing at its most simple is that it is a job. It doesn't change over time. It doesn't have any geographical boundaries. It's solution agnostic. It has a universal structure and all jobs are ultimately processes. So I'll give you an example. We have a constant and repetitive conversation that the travel needs in every market is different. An Indian traveler, a Spanish traveler, a British traveler and an American traveler are fundamentally different. But actually I would argue that they are not, right? So in travel, and I'll, I'll put it in the context of 50 years ago. So if, um, I was at Christmas time and I was in Australia and I picked up a guidebook, which was the Frommer's Guide to Europe on $5 a day. And in that book, it does very simple things, where to go, where to stay, what to do, um, and you know what the price of everything is. What is fascinating is that about 50% of those places still exist today. I, I picked out Madrid. The way that the guidebook references Madrid is still very similar to how we might talk about the city today. And the information that you would now find on a TripAdvisor, on a Condé Nast Traveller is, is fundamentally the same. It hasn't changed over time. It's where to go, where to stay, what to do, and what's the price. So what is different is not actually the processes that the consumer or the traveller is doing in any of the markets at the moment, doesn't matter whether you're Indian, Spanish, French, German, American, British, you are, un, un, you are asking very specific questions at the moment. Can I leave my country? If I can, where can I go? Can I even get on a plane? And therefore, where can I stay and what are the risks associated? So safety has now become a really key part of travel. But the desire to travel has not changed. The desire to go somewhere has not changed. What has actually changed is the destination and the mode of transport, nothing more, nothing less. We still wanna take that three hour week break for a weekend away. It's just now, if you're in the UK, it's very difficult, if not impossible to get on the Eurostar and go to Paris. In fact, you really can't leave the UK, but most people, when they can, they will drive three hours in a car to the destination they can get to. So it's really important to understand that jobs don't change, they never have. What has changed is the technology, the solutions and the information we give them. And in this context, we can be method researchers, creators, product people, writers. You can be an audience, a viewer, a reader, a user, a consumer or a customer. When, if you've, anyone in this group is working in UX, it's often the counter to that. Understand your users. You must interview everybody. You must understand what they're doing fundamentally because there'll be things you will not know. But like an editor, we would never hire someone to be an editor of Vogue or an editor of Condé Nast Traveller who didn't leave, live and breathe the industry. And I know when I'm hiring and recruiting people, particularly on the brand side, it's one of the first questions you know, we ask. We're not gonna hire someone to work in product on the New Yorker if they don't fundamentally care about the craft of that brand. 
um, and vice versa. You want to work on Vogue, then having a real passion for the fashion industry and the content we produce also helps us create a better product for our readers and consumers and customers. So this goes back to re-channeling some of our information. If we understand our consumers and we understand everything that we're doing for them, um, we can then start to craft experiences for them. And note that I will say, and I say this again with my teams, what opportunity are we solving for both the business and the customer? In product, we often use the word problem or pain point. And yes, in a UX perspective, there are lots of problems and pain points. I can't register, I can't log in. That is the rational part of product. But ultimately, the opportunity is something different. How do I get people to learn more about American politics? How do I get people to understand, you know, and know what's going on with the Oscars? And how do we get more people traveling? When you reframe that question, ultimately the answer will be different. So going into two sections, outcomes and then curiosity. We'll go into the rational first. While I sit with two hats on, both a rational and a creative, the quality of the outcome is, and I've mentioned this before, is fundamentally derived from input in and input out. These are the, out, like, if we want to drive an outcome, we can have a certain element of metrics that can give us perspectives, but it will fundamentally also be changed by what we learn along the way. And so it's really important that we are making sure that the inputs, think of it like, like a recipe, you know, anyone can take the same set of ingre ingredients and make a cake and make a roast. But the beauty of the craft is knowing all those little things that you tweak around the edges to create that absolutely like melt in your mouth um, recipe and product. I'm not a great cook. I wish I had the patience. But ultimately the quality of the outcome is fundamentally derived by how much I put in, how much time and how much craft I add to the um, experience to then ultimately get an output out. It's one of the joys of going back into a publishing and ultimately creative business is that the craft becomes just as important. You work in a utility-based digital where it's all about utility and function and performance, that creativity doesn't feel so prevalent. The next part is constraints and um, really important. Um, again, in, a, in an agile world, we feel we can get into quite repetitive. We have to be agile, we have to be lean. It doesn't matter, we will go really fast. But ultimately, if you don't know your North, North Star, you could be building something for a year and not know that you're on the right path. Um, and one of the things that I love is constraints drive decisions, right? And having a decision framework in your processes that helps you structure your puzzles and looking at it in a very project mindset of time, cost and quality. I'll use a reference to publishing from 100 years ago. Um, I, we have a lovely archive in Condé Nast where you can see all the magazines going back to the very first edition of Vogue. In a variety of them, um, we can see the actual ad, ad, where advertising actually comes from. So advertising works in the context of if you need to produce something on the right hand side, it has a cost associated. Therefore, on the left hand side, you need a percentage of ads that basically cover the cost of production. So this is an Irving Penn photograph. Um, it basically has and every single page of the magazine has a reference to what page it was what the photographer was charged, what the model was charged, what all the costs were associated. And this, believe it or not, was a $500 um, photograph. And so from an advertising perspective, you knew you had to you know, fund the cost of the magazine for all the versions of this. Digital advertising actually works fundamentally the same. So it's jobs to be done, right? The role of advertising is to cover the cost of production as opposed to commerce or other forms of monetization. And these decisions also then craft how, how much you will spend on a photographer, how much you will spend on a model, and how much you will spend on all the other beautiful things that you want to add to that image. It also then links to measurement, no different to change management. You can't measure what you can't see. You can't change what you can't see. So having really clear objectives and key results to make sure that you're navigating. So this is a full bleed out of um, a photographic page from one of the magazines and understanding both your incremental and your long-term goals. And this goes to very financial language, which you know, I find fascinating, I struggle with, but also you know, is, a real, is a really fundamental, because it's how businesses work, because it's how you create profit, um, is around your leading and your lagging indicators. 
it is interesting in the world of say digital content and product a lot of people don't know these indicators so it's very hard to then for them to even justify the work that they're doing if they don't understand the metrics that they're looking at so leading metrics are really important, but they will only tell you today and they will only tell you like an algorithm, the information that is in front of you. So if we're measuring architectural digest and wondering why it's not growing and constantly looking at our own Google analytics and constantly looking inward, we are missing the shift of behavior with our consumer. It is actually what happened on Condé Nast Traveller. Um, the moment that we, um, the, the pandemic hit, so literally two days from now in Spain on, on March the 10th, um, traffic dropped 40%. And it was a mad scramble between the audience development teams, um, editorial, and they kept producing more of the same content because the data was telling them that this time last year that that content was performing. So it's all the metrics, whether it's advertising, CPM, CPV, EPC, just you know, an acronym, an acronym, and an acronym. And ultimately what we had to do is that we said, right, let's look through our social listening tools, so a completely different set of dashboards and look at where the conversation has moved to. Because clearly what we're writing about isn't actually working. By doing that, we were able to see two or three important conversations that were happening, not just on our competitors' websites, but actually in the travel space. And it was primarily around what I talked about before. The desire to travel hadn't changed, but the locations had, the safety had, and all those questions. When the brand pivoted to writing content of that nature, within two months, they were ahead. And if not now, um, ahead of their targets. And they are now working that way. That the, And it's been really good to actually train them. I think it would have taken a year to get this team to understand that shift in behavior. Now they don't have a choice. When traffic drops, they go and look to where the conversation has moved to um, and they create. They also are now leading in that conversation in a way that they weren't before because people can come to us for trusted advice. Then you get your bigger picture goals. So when the aggregation of all of that, that can show you your roll up over a year, but they don't predict the future. So it gives you where your growth is coming. It doesn't really factor in external factors like a pandemic, um, but can give you pro projections on your profit and your growth over time which gives us to an element of data blindness. Um, it is very easy to hide behind data. It is fundamental to everything that we do, um, but it is only one piece of our puzzle, right? It is not the only piece of the puzzle and cannot be seen in isolation. Um, with my teams, if they give me one data point, it's basically not, ex not, not acceptable in the sense of you need to put three or four together. If I'm looking at my current analytics, I'm looking at future trends, I'm looking at consumer and audience behavior. My job as the creative or the artist or, or the product leader is to put them all together to actually pinpoint that piece of information that we need. Because sometimes, and this is again, the beauty of an editorial brand is that instinct goes a long way. The reason why our editors are at the forefront of what they do is because they really know the pulse of the industry and the sectors they work in. And they set the conversation. So the last part. Creative curiosity. Collaborative thinking. In a world that is digital, everyone actually has both the opportunity and, and I would say the requirement to be creative. We can get very heads down. Think of that change picture at the beginning where you're so focused on the now, you haven't taken a step back. One of the best pieces of advice is a, a previous um, Boss, the CEO boss of mine gave me it was actually making sure that I scheduled into my time thinking time and I think that you know a variety of leaders have talked about that in their normal day-to-day -day, they actually build thinking time into their work reading articles going on these bizarre explore, explorations reading about topics that actually don't feel like they are connected to their work um, I was not doing that three or four years ago and basically suffered a burnout because I was so into the detail now it's a core part of my day because it actually feeds into ideas and thought processes that I can take back into the organization. And I encourage the teams, it doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or a finance analyst, you can spot something that someone else may miss. So it goes to the point of this talk, which is strategy by making. And it's something that I, I wish we did more of because unfortunately a lot of strategists are financial people, they are numbers people. You know, it's not until, you know, a board deck is done that it often comes to the creators or the thinkers into the organization to actually problem solve. 
But I keep pushing back at the moment now because it is something I learned in art school, which is that you show, don't tell. And it goes back to if you can imagine the future, then people will follow. We are ultimately visual and audio and visceral creatures. We respond to the things we see. Um, so it's prototypes, not PowerPoint. It's the art of the possible through the imagination. And it's bringing those ideas to life. Advertising, ad companies and design companies do it very well. They concept pitch. Even though the thing they concept may not be the final outcome, they, am, they get you to imagine what it would be like to work with them. Because solving customer problems is not only rational, but in, is rational so that I have a problem, right? But actually an opportunity is actually about inspiring customers and that is emotional. This um, is actually uh, a, um, Irving Penn's visual diary. Um, one of the few things I couldn't touch and in the Condé archive, it is a truly an incredible thing. And if you are a photographer or any kind of creative, it's basically your workbook. It's where you seek to get inspiration for your own ideas. And all that it is was examples and cutouts of poses, of lighting, of other people that he was inspired by, um, but forms the foundation of a lot of his future work. So narratives, not spreadsheets. People remember and share stories, both the positive and the negative. If you are trying to change an organization, if the pervasive narrative in your organization is we can't do that, then you won't succeed. You have to convince people to believe in something that didn't exist before. And you have to take those numbers and make it into a vision and a reality that people can create. Um, that is where the craft of, of design comes in. So it's about your imagination, stop wandering and wondering the joys of the unknown and the art of non-doing, the seemingly unconnected um, to create something that is connected. Um, there's, a, there's a moment where all like those ingredients, right? If you start with a recipe, there will be 10 ingredients and it's not until the alchemy of putting them all together, do you, do you create the final product? Do you create that painting? Do you create that, those words on a page? Those words on a page linked to an article, linked to a visual story, have all come together to, to inspire the person that is um, consuming it. And that comes to, through serendipity, right? It is, it is not talked about in business. A traveler will do it by nature, right? It's bringing all these random smells and environments and things that take you off center to make you uh, experience something new. Two parts to the creative brain, no different to product. One is the logical. We are a brain of choice. Is this the better decision to make versus another one? We do think in a linear fashion. If I do this task, if I put this ingredients in and I wait 20 minutes, then something else will happen. And then I do the next task. Working on principles. That is the structure of a successful business, is the, is the heartbeat of how an organization works. Having those foundations at play allows you to become the inventor, to put those odd things together, to make connections that may not have been there before, like the Sahar Hadid building. Who would have thought to put jade carving, the number eight and a hotel together? Curious people take risks. They allow themselves to get productively distracted. So just to wrap up and I'll try and put some, well, I will put some structure around it. Strategy and traveling is really, can be really brutal. It goes back to, it takes time and it takes patience. And it's about bringing all those things together. And I, I, I take that from, you know, a travel kind of narrative around kind of going on an exploration. Oops, forgot that that moved. So here are some key takeaways, very simply. I started in the beginning talking about puzzles and mysteries and how you reframe the question. Simple as that. Are we asking the right question as a group before we start? Become that method creator and designer. Live and breathe the thing you're trying to create because you will understand the pain points as well as the opportunities by being part, part of that ideation. In one of my old companies, we made a physical product. That was the thing was our bread and butter. It was photo box. Every fortnight, or sorry, once a month in our team, we would all make a version of our, that product and then talk about the experience as a group. Not only was it a brilliant um, team building exercise, but it really helped us understand um, the problems we would, the problems as well as the opportunities we were trying to create. You have to mash up your ideas, your data and your insight. 
in, in science, input in all the things that craft to help you get to the output. Then you focus on delivery. Then you map the puzzle and the steps to get there. In an old way of looking at it, and this is what many people do, it's the kind of backbone of, of companies, right? You set some goals, then you do some research, then you brainstorm, and then you may come up with a strategy, although you may have done it before, and then you brainstorm a solution, then you design, and then you test, and then you release. Very linear. Even in an agile way of working, it is how most companies work. Top down, from the management, all the way down into delivery. My, my question to you all is what if you reframed it? It is not an easy process. Teams can struggle with it. You need to have a lot of foundational trust to be able to allow for the messy middle. But doing brainstorming strategy, testing, goal setting, research and design at the same time is how all those ingredients come together to make that final cake. So these were, um, I'll give you three books that you um, want to read. Then I think they're available in most languages. I know that my team's checked, definitely not in Russian apparently. Um, but The Messy Middle um, by Scott Belsky in terms of um, the framework of, of how creatives of any kind work and that's sitting in that space in the middle. Um, I cannot take credit for Puzzles and Mysteries. It comes from a book called Curious, The Desire to Know and Why Your Future Depends on It. It is a fascinating, um, sociological and anthropological book about how our brains deal with curiosity. I did not realise there's about six different ways that our brain um, approaches that concept. Um, and in a business context, uh, Imagine It Forward from Beth Comstock, who was the CMO at GM globally, and basically talks about the, the, both the struggle and the opportunity and the innovation that was brought into um, GM um, by bringing in these kind of creative practices. And that is it. Thank you for listening. There's some fantastic questions. I'm struggling to even know where to start here, but there's one that kind of really struck out to me because of everything that we're seeing in media at the moment. But um, just to say thanks for a fantastic presentation as well, Mel. And I am really thinking about beating the algorithms and uh, <laughs> I'll start listening maybe to Country and Restaurant on Spotify and see what that might <laughs> open up for me as well. Um, but with regards to metrics, we are seeing a rapid rise in the clubhouse and Twitter spaces, social voice space. Do you see brands playing a role here or are you doing anything in the social voice space as these platforms are relatively new and you know some of the metrics may not be in place yet? Uh, well, there's no form. I think that the really interesting thing about club space is it's, it's like you know the gardens of Twitter and Facebook 10 years ago, right? Like, People are just playing to see what works before they formalize any strategy. We don't have anything yet, but a variety of, uh, I think it's really interesting when I look at it, a variety of uh, thought leaders who are already on the social space are there Are there now. Um, I think of Alessia, uh, I won't say her name correctly, Galiviano, who is the um, photo editor of um, Italian Vogue. And so she's already on there doing exactly the same thing. So it goes back to the jobs to be done, right? She's not doing anything different. It's just the forum that she's using is different. She's still doing portfolio reviews. She's still advising and inspiring the next round of photographers. It's just that where she is is different. So I think for us in terms of the value in terms of the metrics is around, there's not a monetization model there for us. So it would be about time relative to value. Um, I would think that brands will find a space for it. And then it depends on whether or not it becomes a gimmick or not. I mean, I think Clubhouse will have an interest. I saw an article today, I don't know if it was the time, somewhere on LinkedIn, so I can't remember, about will it be relevant when we come out of quarantine or lockdown, sorry? It may not, it could be of the time. It certain, certainly seems to have a different reaction on different weeks um, on LinkedIn and other social media spaces. So we're keeping an eye on it. Um, you spoke about inspiring co customers um, and, and emotional and there's a rational approach to solving problems. Is there a balance here or do people or teams ultimately approach things differently? You may be solving different problems at different times. Um, and that's actually quite a hard one. We, we're split product-wise between brand and platform. And so you tend to find that people working on the platform side are much more of the rational side. 
that being said, if you're to do anything interesting, you need to understand the emotional, right? And that actually really means having a very deep knowledge of your customer and what they're doing and not the rational, how many have subscribed and how many have converted and all those metrics that you get on spreadsheets, but it's ultimately, and I saw this, we actually did a talk recently with one of my ex-colleagues at Photobox. Um, when you are creating something that is so emotional, um, and the example being we had a photo box is a, um, for context, is a company in Europe like Shutterfly in the US where you can get a custom photo book, a mug, where a photo is ultimately on that physical artifact. And we were designing all these technologies to make it go faster because the pain point we were hearing was it takes too long, it takes too long, blah, blah, blah. When we built that technology, no one used it. And the reason being is that they didn't want it to take longer because actually the craft of making a photo book was amazing. What they wanted to go more efficiently were the really functional tasks. So just the general things of the layout. Um, and so that's really interesting when you're looking at rational versus emotional, that you assume that speed is metric, when actually that's not what, and you have to actually understand behavior and the outcome they're trying to drive, not the metric you are trying. The metric is a, is a company-wide metric, not a consumer metric. So maybe the answer is, maybe we need customer metrics rather than just commercial and revenue. Excellent. Um, one of our attendees is curious about the images in the first uh, set of slides that you had. Oh, you God. had a, a, a female image uh, linked with the content in, itself. Um, you know, was this an intentional image or is this going back to what you mentioned with Aoife that you had to be careful of some of the images that you were using? Yeah, it was a bit of both in the sense of, yes, I was trying to make a, a, um, a link at the beginning. Towards the end, I don't think there was a link, but I, I kind of flipped it quite quickly. Unfortunately, in the previous version with Conde, I had them much more aligned. Um, but I think that's interesting, right? I often find it in presentations, people just put in generic images. And therefore, if you're listening to someone's words and you're looking at something on the screen, you will make a, a connection. And I've done workshops where I show people the translation of images in particular into meaning and it's different so, so I think some were good as I was looking at it I was like oh, I should change that image <laughs> it was my own experiment to learn <laughs> um great experiment um you spoke as well about how in the digital world the story we're telling about the future is a story driven by technology uh once and not what we as humans need um do you have any more thoughts um, as we have at all, you know, have been having to think, you know, differently within the past year or so? Yeah, that's a really hard one that like, again, it's a kind of psychological and a philosophical one. How do I answer that? I think that, I mean, technology, so it is the world we live in today and there is a beauty in the technologies that we use. And I was having a conversation you know, with someone on, on the weekend who has two young children and, you know, there are people and they're very young and they're at the school and some people are like, I can't give my, you know, people that have my children the devices and I have to keep it pure. That is the, the world that they live in, you know, and, and they learn things faster than we did. I had to make my first TikTok video yesterday for work and I realised it was not as easy as I thought. Um, but the, the thing that I also, again, I've, I've learned and reflected on, and I think it's maybe a function of culture, so for example, I'm sorry if there are any Spanish people on the course, this is my interpretation. What I love about Spanish culture is often when you're around the table, the phone is not there, right? So I have to have these conversations where people go, I didn't use my phone, I didn't look at it for five hours. If you go out often with say English or American, some people, the etiquettes change and they're just on their phones the same time. I had that problem with my son for a while. Literally now I have applied that more European, I suppose, logic, which is just put the thing down. I think we need to learn as humans to let it go. The same things like Clubhouse, you don't have to be online the whole time and everywhere. Choose very specifically the conversations you want to be part of and stay very present. Um, also, I feel that I did 100 days lockdown in Madrid without human, in, you know, not human interaction. I was online all day. Um, so now I'm way more precious about that when, I, when we had those moments where I, I just, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but it's more of a, our, our own needs about, we are human beings. We need physical and human contact. So the sooner we can get back to that, the better. 
Yeah, totally agree. And great thoughts on that. I think um, we will never take for granted again, you know, just the kind of human interaction. Um, and while technology has, you know, been able to kind of uh, support us in communicating, nothing kind of replaces, um, you know, the real uh, engagement that you you, know, yeah. you can have and um, I know that in our household I'm certainly learning technology from younger members all the time which always uh, clearly amazes me as well um, you know just given the position that you're in and the role that you're in and I love the fact that you're you know taking photography as you travel as well um, how much how much of a kind of pent-up demand do you think we're going to um, see you know uh, for travel, you know, from your experience, um, a lot of people are, you know, really looking forward to traveling, um, but they haven't been able to. Will we see a huge spike um, once people are allowed to travel again? I, I both dream it, desire it, but I'm also 100% convinced it will happen. I'll use Australia as the example um, when, or Melbourne, right? So Melbourne closed its um, international borders for six months, so I was unable to get home. When I got home, they were just coming out of, and Australia's interesting because it is, and like New Zealand, it's COVID free. And there's still a little bit of PTSD, but you do, you can go to events, you can go to um, theater, you can do all those things again. Without question, the first thing that every single person I knew did was travel. But the thing that people need to understand, and I say this at work, the desire for travel has never stopped. What has changed is the mode of transportation. So everyone says the, the market won't pick up for the next, two or three years. The international market won't. That'll take that until we can fly safely, that is a much harder thing. So airlines are, are, are in trouble in that context and big and, and, and countries that rely on international tourists. So Spain is interesting. 15% of GDP is, is travel, majority coming from the spenders of Americans, Chinese and British. And so until they can travel, part of the Spanish economy can't recover. That being said, 80% of Spanish people do not leave Spain when they travel. So you get huge um, spikes into the destinations that they go to. So they're already booked up all summer, right? Um, and for us, is it's about flying. Um, I can guarantee, you know, everyone's talking, what is it in the UK? June the 21st. The moment that you can, you will be off and running. People will still be nervous, but, I'm, you know, the... It'll, it'll, be, it'll be huge. The thing we need to be mindful of humans is to do it gradually so that we're not finding a situation where it's another peak of, of, of something and we get locked up again. The thing I like about Madrid at the moment, weirdly, is we have, no, we have a curfew, but not a lockdown. So both industry and you know, health is managed concurrently rather than the two extremes. That's where we've got to get to in the next couple of years. Okay, very good, very good. Um, we have another great question up on our Q&A here. Um, do you have any tips on how to introduce this new way of working into an organisation whose leadership is still very much mired in the old way? Yeah, so you need to get your foundations and prove that you can deliver. Trust is the key to everything. Then, like all type of prototyping, find an experiment. It's what I've done in every company. Find the place you can play where you know you're going to win um, because you've got to sh no one's going to believe that you can change through a spreadsheet alone or a PowerPoint. You have to show the behaviour on the ground. So I often pick, I use the prototyping metaphor, a small area to kind of find a group of people of like-minded and start changing because then that's that viral nature of its scales and people go, oh, why don't I have that? Like, why don't I have that? And that's what's happening now a little bit at Condé, where some of the things that we tried on smaller brands, people are saying, well, when, do, when does that apply to this brand? Um, but that's because it's, it's working. If it wasn't working, we would be doing something else. Okay. Um... Aoife, I, I take it we have we've time for more questions, yes? Uh, I think we have time for another one or two, yep. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, we often get caught up in being outcomes focused and driving the end result. Um, your discussion about outcomes and the quality of outcomes being fundamentally derived from input in and output out. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I think it's about, it goes back to the framing of the question. If you ask what you think is the wrong question, the right question, it'll lead you down to a path that might not get you the outcome. If I give an example of 
trying to think of a not one that we're doing at the moment, but um, if I think about it in the context of what we were doing at the Telegraph in terms of trying to rebuild um, and reimagine Telegraph travel, it was around the brief of making the fifty million dollar business, which was fine. That's the foundations of what we built. That was the first input. In terms of the things that we did, we changed the question to actually how do we get more people traveling, right? So we had a suite of product and services. So they were the inputs that we put in with all the different mechanisms. That was after though, we had a whole range of people, you know, external consultants do all these lovely innovation workshops with all these far-fetched ideas about what we could make. And, and basically when I came in halfway through, I said, let's pause, we fix our foundational product first we look at how people are traveling and we do more of that faster and at scale. And that's what we did. So those inputs were about being very focused on your, in your IP, your core proposition, the foundational steps, and then building the ecosystem around it. That's where the creativity, creativity comes like that, that a slide. You have to understand the rules like a pro to then break them like artists. But you learn that at art school. You know, you don't become a famous painter without learning the fundamentals of painting first, or photography, or light, or color. Then you learn. Then you learn how to experiment. And if if somebody feels they're not necessarily, you know, very creative, if they're of more a, maybe a rational mindset, are there any tips, you know, so that they feel uh, they can work towards contributing more to a creative process? Yep. So one of the things I do, I, my role is to create the right football team, not to, to use that or use another metaphor, right? Like in terms of everyone has a role to play. You can't have all creators on your team because you will fail, right? And you can't have all structural people because you won't do anything interesting. Um, and I was saying this to the Vogue product director the other day, which is, you know, in organisations, you can have a star player. So think of Portugal, Ronaldo, right? Everything works around the star player and you go through. I always use the, the team. We, he used Germany. I used Colombia, which is they always worked as a team. They had a few star players, but like even when they celebrated, when they did their dance, they all got together as a group. And in that context, you understand what you need. So I know that I need two or three very... And we, and we kind of joke about it. In my teams, I also hire for my own weakness. So my own weakness is often around the delivery and the structural. So I hire people who effectively, and they joke, translate me. So they provide the foundational steps. They keep everyone focused. They do the regular comms. They keep that continuity. And then we add the sort of people who can bounce around the edges. Maybe that's harder if you're not the leader, but that, that's certainly about how you create the team so that you can have all the trade-offs. So that's probably a different answer, but make sure you're part of a team where you find a creative person, it's collaboration that you can spar with or you can learn from because they will learn something from you. And I, I actually love the people who are most structural in my teams because it provides us with a rhythm and a heartbeat. If you are too creative, you'll have too many extremes and then it becomes too volatile. So that's not healthy either. Yeah, that's excellent. I think, you know, collaboration, anytime we have discussions, especially in the Think Global Forum community, collaboration is hugely important, um, you know, for producing global content and having different kind of ideas and aspects and that. So we, we need people, you know, from with different frameworks of thought to be able to, you know, produce that as well. Excellent. Okay, um, Mel, thank you so much for your time today. That was a a really, truly wonderful presentation with um, a lot of food for thought for everyone. Um, thank you very much indeed, and hope to see you back at another one of our sessions. Hopefully, normally we have these um, Think Global forums in person, so one of these days we'll uh, hopefully all share a glass of wine or a cup of coffee <laughs> and have another chat to see how we're all getting on. Thank you very much, Mel. Thank you so much for inviting me. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Aoife, and thank you, Mel. It was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal presentation. I love the, the messy middle. Uh, it was something that I had um, heard from a good friend of mine in the context of some kind of leadership changes and, and things like that, and I, I loved 
that reference again and and i love the way like you know to kind of change things or to break things even you kind of need to know the basics first so like a painter you know to to kind of do something different and uh, you need to know first how to how to uh do the basics so thank you mel thank you everybody for your patience and um, thank you also to tom um very very much for for the opening address and as we mentioned on the chat we're going to make sure that um we we get everybody a full recording of the address um so that uh, as, as some of you mentioned you know you you get all the value of tom's um comments and, and input and again thank you to mel for for being our keynote speaker for today i'm going to invite our illustrator hank to show his um, sketch uh, of, of today, of today's session, what he has been capturing in the background. So um, could we please have Hank's sketch on the screen? Yeah, you have already a few. Brilliant. <laughs> Not ready yet, but uh, I'm working on it. Um, it's a, a summary of, uh, of the keynote of uh, Mel. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, so if you want some explanation, I can explain. Uh, if it's self-explaining, it could be very good. <laughs> I think it is. It is certainly amazing. I would. I would ask Mel if she's still um, um, here with us. Um, how do you feel it reflects? Um, the, the the keynote um but i mean we're, we're going to be making this available to everybody as well um i i think from my perspective it, it seems impressive it really does look impressive oh, yeah no i loved it i want a copy of it already <laughs> <laughs> excellent excellent thank you really thank you man. sorry go ahead man i say like, thank you it was really it's actually really good i want to kind of have a what came up so fast but like it is a I love it when you get a visual representation of you know, a story that you tell. Yes. And it was a great story. So. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're going to have one of these at the end of um, every day. You can, um, as we mentioned earlier, you can expect really highly interactive sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. As we mentioned, Global Content Ops uh, tomorrow world ux on wednesday and global technical communications on thursday and then on friday we're in for a treat uh, with mark pollock's masterclass um, and it, that will be preceded by a desk yoga session to kind of help us wind down and and uh, get get kind of uh, sort of free up our mind before before the masterclass. so do make sure to join us for that as well um, we're going to be sending a survey at the end of the week, so we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, we're here to support. Just let us know if you haven't received the links or if you have any other um, difficulties at all. But um, other than that, I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Um, guys, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, um, rather than just guys, as somebody corrected me once. And uh, thank you, everybody, once again. It has been a great session and hopefully you have enjoyed it as much as we have. Thank you.